Fire Pit Creative Group presents Aftermath, Episode 5, Traveling Light. In 2057 and 2069, the people of Earth faced many trials. Scarcity of resources, plagues, poverty, famine, and despair. The superpowers of the Earth fell into factions, each armed with its own doomsday arsenal. Diplomacy failed, and civilization came to an end. Not with a whimper, but with a bang. General Benjamin Castro, the Israeli government's special envoy to the United Nations, was relocated from the UN headquarters in New York City to an underground base. During transport, General Castro was knocked unconscious and preserved in cryostasis. The general awoke 43 years later, in a subterranean society built by survivors of the United Nations. Revived by the Phoenix Project, General Castro was introduced to Phoenix law enforcement officer Major Leonard McGillicuddy and Professor John Bath. If they could work together, Castro, Cuddy, and Bath would lead the first expedition to the Earth's surface. Aided by Project Administrator Danielle Devenu, Chief Surgeon Miro Ganaya, and Engineer Donna Chang, their mission was to determine what life still existed on the world above and if the survivors in the underground Phoenix Project could return. Cuddy pulled the lock and threw open a cellar door. The Major, General Castro, and Dr. Bath climbed upwards into the light. My God. Castro spoke slowly, quietly. He gazed across the island, across the river at New York City in the distance. The destruction. The devastation. Cuddy tapped Castro's shoulder. General, look. Castro followed the Major's gaze to the base of the statue, up the length of Lady Liberty's robes to her weathered, metal face. It's so much bigger than I imagined, Cuddy said. He paused, in awe of what he was looking at. Castro pointed at a row of raised buildings in the distance. There's Manhattan Island, he said. I can't believe it. The buildings are decimated. Look at all the fires. Bath stepped in front of Castro and Cuddy. Forgive me, General. It looks bad, but the fires are actually a good sign. They appear to be man-made, not spontaneous, and not the results of any attack. Couldn't they be caused by lightning or something? asked Cuddy. Bath shook his head. I don't think so. There's oxygen, however polluted, a heavy smog content, but I'm guessing oxygen and carbon dioxide levels are within breathable parameters. At the very least, there is life that is adapted to these conditions. If they can breathe what's in the air and there's oxygen to start fires, we can breathe as well. How can you be sure? Castro asked. I can't, Bass shrugged, not without further observation at least. But that, gentlemen, is pollen. Bath pointed to the ground, then at the chalky mist in the air. Of course, it's likely contaminated, but it's also a sign of photosynthesis. The doctor walked a few feet, then waved Castro and Cuddy over. He pointed at the knee-high grass and brush growing nearby. And that appears to be excrement. Excrement, Cuddy repeated. Wonderful. Castro turned to Cuddy. It is a sign of life, Major. Bath gazed up. The clouds are clearly polluted, he said, but that blue suggests at least a nitrogen-based composition to the atmosphere, not unlike what the Academy records suggest about the old Earth. I'm sure the air is breathable. It may not be healthy, but it's breathable. I need to take soil and water samples. Maybe I can put together a lab of some sort. If only I had... Sounds great, Cuddy interrupted him. You can do that later. Right now, we have work to do. Our assignment is to search for signs of life on Manhattan Island, remember? 
Instinctively, General Castro gazed around. He made note of his surroundings, the weather, the climate. He estimated the time of day, looked for shelter, and wondered what obstacles they might face getting off the island. The sun is going down. We're going to lose the little light we have. But General, Bath reminded him, the lenses in these bodies should adapt to the loss of light. Castro nodded. That may be so, but let's spread out and see what we can find for shelter if we're going to be here much longer. And we need to requisition materials to build a skiff or barge to make it over to the mainland. Any signs of danger, anything moves, give a shout, Cuddy said. I'll be there. Bath nodded. He walked away from where they emerged on the island and towards the shoreline. As Major McGillicuddy surveyed the base of the Statue of Liberty, he reflected on events in his life leading up to that moment. He thought of his parents, of course, his father's career in law enforcement, and his mother's nurturing efforts to make their home different from others in the Phoenix Project. Their home was a safe place, full of love and hope. Even when his father had difficult days on patrol, putting down violence or counseling others, Mac always returned home. They didn't talk about his day. They ate dinner together and talked about the future. Cuddy's parents spoke optimistically about a day when they would all go to the surface. Sure, when that day came, they'd be older and slower, but they'd also be proud of what they had accomplished in the Phoenix Project. That day never came. Cuddy's father passed away suddenly. His mother became sick not long after. Dana Marsh informally adopted Cuddy, allowing him to live in the Law Division's barracks until he was old enough to choose a career. But he never really had a choice. Law enforcement was the magnet, Cuddy the metal. Only by protecting and serving could he honor the memory of his parents. He swore to ensure the Phoenix Project exemplified the values on which it was constructed, liberty and justice. And he swore to chase his parents' dream, to find a way to return to the surface. Wandering through the dusty museum at the base of the Statue of Liberty, at the sculpted personification of liberty and justice, something in Cuddy sank. Suddenly, he heard General Castro behind him, reading a poetic inscription. From the New Colossus, Castro spoke earnestly, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. It was a lovely notion, wasn't it? It makes you wonder, said Cuddy. What's that? Castro asked. Cuddy furrowed his brow. Can liberty rise again? Will 3,000 Phoenix Project citizens rebuild the human race? Castro put a hand on the Major's shoulder. Come on, Cuddy. This is the beginning of the adventure, not the end of it. The Major nodded, trying to summon the energy needed to push forward. Yes, sir. What have you found? Castro asked. Well, there's plenty of wood, twine, glass, and paper, Cuddy said. Also, some dried ink pens. I may be able to fashion a shank. Castro nodded. He pointed to a torn backpack in one corner. Grab that canvas sack, he said, realizing it probably belonged to squatters. Dead or alive, he didn't care. Stash everything you can. McGillicuddy moved quickly. He filled the bag with everything he could find, including shards of broken glass. He wasn't quite sure why, he just knew he needed a weapon. Something to give him an advantage if he was attacked or if he needed to attack someone himself. Back outside, Cuddy noticed a dirt-encrusted plaque. He got the general's attention and nodded towards the sign. What's that? The cornerstone, Castro said. It was laid by the Freemasons. Freemasons? Cuddy was confused. Uh, it's a long story, Castro shrugged. He remembered his attaché at the United Nations, a much younger man named Roth. Not unlike Bath, he was brilliant, fearless, and arrogant. They were a secret society of sorts, Castro explained. Great, Cuddy said, another secret society. Hey, I, I guess the doctor was right. Somebody has been here. Cuddy inched closer. He saw words spray painted across the base of the statue in black and red. This is recent. Cuddy traced the paint. What does it mean? Thralls all? 
Castro shook his head. I don't know, but... Before the general could finish, they heard shouting in the distance. It was Bath. Castro and Cuddy walked hurriedly towards Bath's voice. They crossed over the direction from which they came to the shoreline and a dockside port. A two-story ferry boat was anchored nearby. Take a look at that, Bath said as the others approached. The Circle Line Ferry. Cuddy read the faded title on the side of the boat. Does it work? Bath shook his head. Not sure. Castro led Cuddy and Bath down the short dock. He walked cautiously. If there have been scavengers here, we can count on it being stripped of petroleum and anything else of value. If it's still navigable, we may be able to strip it down and fix a sail to it. Bath looked up. The wind is blowing, but there's a lot of chaff in the air. Radiation? Castro asked. Uh, negligible, said Bath. Probably carbon monoxide, burnt rock and metal. Cuddy followed Bath's gaze overhead. He saw birds flying in formation. They circled over the water, then took turns diving, retrieving something and rejoining the group. What the hell is that? Cuddy asked. Laridae Lari, Bath replied, matter-of-factly. A gull of some kind. I've never seen one, Cuddy said. Are they supposed to be... No, Castro said before Bath could reply. They're not. It's confirmation of mutation. Natural selection, said Bath. That's the biggest damn seagull I've ever seen, Castro said. Cuddy shifted, looking at Bath, but keeping an eye on the seagulls. You think they pose a threat? Bath grinned. <laughs> Let's hope they didn't get fat eating the tourists. Castro walked closer to the ferry. All right, let's see what we have to work with and get the hell out of here, he said. The sooner the better. Cuddy, you're with me. Dr. Bath, why don't you take shelter in Lady Liberty? We'll be right there. General Castro and Major McGillicuddy boarded the boat. Cuddy was uneasy at first, having never been on a vessel floating in water. It reminded him of the hydrotherapy he endured after a riot on one of the lower levels of the Phoenix Project. Well, what do you think? Castro walked across the deck towards the engine room. A few feet away, Cuddy walked cautiously along the outside of the ferry. Well, looks like somebody's already been here, he said, taking note of scuffs and scrapes in the rails and pillars of the boat. He turned, following deep black and red prints that led away from the engine room. They didn't look quite like footprints. Perhaps some animal, something with webbed paws or feet. You know how to operate a ship like this? Cuddy asked Castro. The general turned. He followed Cuddy's gaze down to the prints on the deck. A uh, boat, yes. Castro looked up at Cuddy. The expression on the other man's face suggested they were thinking the same thing. There was a mutual concern. In the engine room, Castro focused on the instruments, tested a few switches. Wait, this can't be. What? asked Cuddy. This gauge reads almost a full tank of gas, Castro replied. It's been idling recently. Cuddy turned slowly. He looked out the window. There was movement along the rocky shoreline. Yeah. Cuddy said, tapping General Castro's arm. I think I see why. We've got company. Cuddy sprang into action. He raced out of the control room with Castro close behind. With the sun descending, it was difficult to see more than motion. He couldn't tell if the bodies he saw were approaching or going away from him. Castro scrambled. Grab that hook. He pointed at a weighted emergency anchor in a nearby compartment. Come on. Cuddy did as he was told easily retrieving the heavy hook and thick rope from where it was attached. With one swift motion, he broke the rope, a sign his mechanical simulacrum was stronger than him. Castro darted from the ferry across the bridge. Dr. Bath! Castro called out. John! John! Cuddy followed closely behind General Castro. He felt a sense of urgency, but strangely enough, he felt no rush of adrenaline, no quickening of the flesh, a racing of the heart through his synthetic body. General Castro raced towards the base of the Statue of Liberty, back to where he and Cuddy left Dr. Bath. As he approached, two men seemed to come at him out of nowhere. That's enough right there, Daddy. One man spoke in a guttural, raspy voice. Castro balled his fist. 
unsure of exactly what he was looking at. We don't want any trouble. Castro made out two ungroomed forms hunched over. They were men, but they appeared more feral than human. There was another man with us, Castro said. I'm sure me mates be taking care of him right now, said the other man. He lumbered out of the statue's massive shadow, closer to Castro. He got them cans on him? Castro shrugged. He signaled to Cuddy to put some space between them. He didn't want to lose any ground or let both of the men jump him. Cans? Cuddy asked. What's that? The first man scoffed. Gray phlegm spotted his cracked lips. <clears throat> Where you come from, boy? He motioned to the statue with long, sharpened fingernails. Liberty's ours. You're in the rat trap now, son. Cuddy didn't need to feel adrenaline or the rush of blood to take offense, to stand his ground, to teach this creature some respect. Who you callin' son? Cuddy glared. Castro shifted, moving when the others did. He looked straight ahead at the man speaking. He kept an eye on the larger, darker-skinned man with his peripheral vision. The simulacrum synthetic lenses enhanced his own eyesight. Look, Castro said, forcefully. Let us get our friend, and we can work this out. They heard the distinct sound of Dr. Bath crying out from inside the statue's base. The man in front of Castro and Cuddy stopped moving. Sounding a bit late for that now. He grinned wide, showing spaces between misshapen, fang-like teeth. Turn out your pockets. We're going to have your cans, or we're going to have your life. Before Castro could respond, Major McGillicuddy leapt into action. He crossed in front of Castro, grappling the beastly figure. Watching the fray, General Castro was unsure which of the men was snarling. It sounded like Cuddy. The general forced his way into their other assailant. He felt thick flesh and overgrown body hair like that of an animal. Was this the product of some kind of mutation? Or had these survivors sacrificed hygiene, abandoned their humanity for a more animalistic way of life? Castro toppled the man, slamming his fist hard into his jaw, behind the ear. Cuddy and the leader of the two rolled on the ground nearby. Cuddy emerged on top. General, get bath. I've got these two. Castro rose, hesitating briefly. You sure? Cuddy brought a closed fist down into his opponent's stomach, his face, and then his windpipe. A sudden sound of knuckle on bone punctuated Cuddy's punches. The man shrieked in pain then let out a slow, almost inaudible gasp. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure, Cuddy said, satisfied with himself. He walked toward Castro, and then hovered over their other attacker who was trying to get up. General Castro ran into the dim corridor below the statue. Dr. Bath, Castro called out. His eyes swept the room. There, in the half-light, he saw Dr. Bath's simulacrum crumbled on the floor. One of the feral beasts hunched over the doctor. Bath! Aftermath, a Fire Pit Creative Group production. Based on a story created by Rhett Davis, with characters created by Rhett Davis, Warren Davis, Willem DeGrieff, and Cole Hoopengarner. Original script by Warren Davis, with Cole Hoopengarner. Narrated and produced by Cole Hoopengarner, with music by Warren Davis. Links to the sound effects used for Aftermath can be found in the description section of each episode. Aftermath and its story and characters are copyright 2019 by Fire Pit Creative Group.